Okay, so um, so the next thing I want to cover off is basically the, the fun stuff. It's the, the development. So once you've got a bit of an understanding about who your audience is and who you're trying to target, and I guess you've got that lay of the land, the next stage is to really go and work out, okay, how do I actually get my social media strategy started? What goes into that from a content perspective and a marketing perspective? So there's three parts of this. So you really need to kind of choose the channels that are going to be most appropriate to you. I'm going to go back to that other slide in a moment. Then it's about setting up a content strategy. And uh, that means different things to different people, but, but I'll, I'll tell you what it means to us in a moment. And, and then the idea of a content calendar is really, really important to create that consistency about what you're doing. So just to, to kick off, there are six platforms that are used in social media in New Zealand on a regular basis. So podcasts, I'm not going to talk about too, that too much now. Podcasts is a channel that is hugely relevant today. Everybody's getting podcasts up, everybody's going, going down that road, and, and audio is the way of the future, but I'm going to address that in a little bit more detail later. So if you talk about the platforms that most people are using today, Facebook is obviously the biggest. Facebook uh, seems to attract people over the ages of 25, mostly now. Um, so it was the people that jumped on in 2007 and they've been with the platform and, and stuff like that going forward, but it hasn't been a hot platform for younger people. Um, they're more leaned to Instagram and Snapchat and a few of these other platforms. But great if you're looking at targeting people between the ages to 25 to 54 because, believe it or not, those people that you'd never consider your customers in business 10 years ago, they're the people in middle, middle management today that are spending the money and in, in the buying roles. So Facebook, believe it or not, is an incredibly valuable platform even if you're in that business to business world. Because chances are if you position your content in the right way and you're using some of the platform benefits, which we'll talk about later, uh, it's a great way to get your, your content exposed to decision makers. Um, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is a great, great avenue for B2B. 40% uh, of the people on LinkedIn are in a decision making role in an organization. But people really consume content on LinkedIn. So it's a great place if you're doing articles or uh, videos, uh, something that's working really, really well on LinkedIn at the moment, little short form video content. Um, so so that, is, that is a very strong platform for, for business to business. Uh, Instagram and Pinterest, these are your visual channels. Um, Pinterest is something that is incredible. 90% uh, of the posts that actually go up on, Insta uh, so on Pinterest are businesses promoting products. So travel destinations, holiday destinations, fashion, jewelry, uh, there's a whole raft of things that go up on Pinterest, but it's the one platform where you don't mind to be marketed to because when you go to Pinterest, you're looking for inspiration and ideas. So in fact, actually you're in the headspace where you're most open to being influenced in terms of purchase decision. So a lot of people that use Pinterest on a regular basis, most of them will have a correlation between a purchase that they've made directly from something that they've actually seen on Pinterest. It, it's quite fascinating. Instagram has come a long way. Obviously, they're now owned by Facebook as well. Um, Instagram is a visual stream of content. Um, and both Facebook and Instagram have been doing something interesting recently, which is stories, storytelling through your phone. And that's something we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later as well. Um, so context, Instagram attracts 18 to 29-year-olds. Instagram is definitely skewed to a more female audience. But it does, it does get guys as well. Um, in fact, more in this country than other country, there are a lot of guys using Instagram. Um, Pinterest, once again, skewed towards women. 80% of people that used um, or use Pinterest in terms of their global population are, are female. Um, YouTube is more male dominated. Um, YouTube is a fantastic place to go to when you're looking for how-to content. And something that businesses are starting to do more and more now is build their brand and get their brand recognized through kind of being the first point of call for resource. So you might be a building company or you might be a renovation company and you want people to obviously come and do renovations with you. So you might be a plumber, for instance, and you might be going out and actually trying to attract people to, um, to call you when they've actually got a problem or a leak or, or a bathroom issue that needs to be fixed. But usually people's first point of call isn't to jump on the phone, it's to see if they can fix it themselves. And the place that they go to to try and figure out if they can do it themselves is YouTube. Right? So, so there's an opportunity there in that space to capture that attention with content that's going to be useful, but if the problem's too severe, obviously you want them to call you. Well, if you've kind of added a value and they've seen you, they're more likely to contact you than someone else. 
So there are content plays and ways that you can use each of these platforms depending on the audience and the ages that you're trying to target. Um, so once you've kind of got a bit of an understanding about who it is and where they're likely to reside, this is kind of what you want to focus on when you're working out what content. So here's a couple of questions. So the first question, what is the brand positioning and tone of voice? So we talked about personality. Okay, so when you think about how you post and what content you post, are you trying to make your content relevant? Are you trying to make it engaging? Are you trying to make it educational? Um, so Facebook, for instance, uh, one of the hot pieces of content on Facebook at the moment is these 30 second videos that are pretty much just glorified slideshows with a bit of background music and a little bit of text that wrap over, over the top of that. Um, they're not high quality pieces of content, but they're interesting because you can watch them without audio and you can read the messages and usually the photos are, are quite engaging. But, but that kind of stuff works really well from an educational point of view on, on the platform. We talked about also what's, what's of interest to people. Um, so, you know, once again, if you use those buyer personas and if you do a couple of them, you'll start to get a, a bit of a handle on the interests that these people have. Are they, do they have young kids? Are they involved in sporting clubs? Do they like healthy, healthy food? You know, are, are they making healthy food choices? You can start to kind of work out what are the buzz things or the topics or the trending subject matter that your audience is most likely to be interested to. And even if you don't provide that directly as a brand, if there's a link and you can stand in that gap and you can provide that value, there's a really great way to actually get your business and services exposed through that content as well. Uh, the other thing, you know, a really good indicator is if you've posted stuff in the past, if you've been running social media for a little while, go back, we, we looked at that engagement metric before, work out what's actually gone well for the audience that you do have and actually maybe create more of that. Um, and something that we're going to talk about a little bit later is find out what people are searching for, okay? So a lot of YouTube, for instance, and we'll talk about YouTube later, YouTube is the second largest search engine worldwide. And believe it or not, when you go onto Google and when you go onto YouTube and you start typing in a few characters, it will start to auto-populate a list of things that they think might be relevant to you based on what is most searched on using those keywords. So you might type in video marketing and the next word that auto-populates might be company. It might be video marketing products. It might be video marketing, you know, whatever. Um, but in that order, it'll give you about eight to 10 options. And those are prioritized by what's most searched on on Google and YouTube. And if you can create content like articles, for instance, if you know what's getting searched on Google, and you can create articles and content that has those keywords in the subject lines, it's a really great way to get your content exposed to more people organically. Uh, so keeping some of these things in mind when you start to produce content is really important to the success of that content because at the end of the day, you can be really good on a platform, you can be posting a lot of stuff, but if the content's not good, people won't engage with it and it will be a bit of a waste of time. So the journey starts with actually getting the right, the right content. So here's a bit of a graph, a couple of circles. As a business, I want somebody to do something. I want people to buy a product or visit a, an event or you know, do something, right? And so I want people to hear what I have to say. I want people to do something through, through what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. That isn't necessarily going to be the way that people want to hear things. People have their own desires. They've got their own personalities and motivations in life. So what you want to do is you want to figure out what your audience actually wants to hear and blend it with what you want to say and find this middle ground and that's where your relevancy comes from. Okay, so if you can kind of position your content in that sweet spot, that's where you're going to get the most traction and the most engagement on what you want to say. Uh, what you want to say. There's some other things here from a content strategy point of view. So relevance is really, really important. Your incentive is really, really important. So when you post something, obviously, typically speaking, you want them to go somewhere or do something, okay? And if there's a call to action in there, you want, to, you want it to be clear. You want to make it crystal clear when they click on this or when they see it, what do you want them to do? It might be simply like the post, right? Or drop us a comment if you agree, right? But be clear at the response that you're after when you actually put something up. And then timing is really, really important as well. Different platforms have different timing in terms of when you post, it's going to get the most traction and the most success. Instagram? Does anybody want to uh, take a guess at the two times of day that are most successful in terms of getting organic reach on an Instagram post? 
Any, any? Lunch? 10. Okay. It's 9 a.m. in the morning and 6 p.m. at night. And there's about an hour either side of that where it ramps up. Why do you think that is? Before work, after work. People are in transit. You know, they're busing, they're, they're not, they might be ready to knock off work and they've pulled their phone out, you know, as the clock ticks down to kind of distract themselves. But there's generally two peaks either side of that day. That's when people grab their phone and they start looking at content. And the morning is generally more successful than the evening because believe it or not, the first thing people do when they wake up in the morning is they reach for their phone. So if you can align your content to be posted at the time of day that's going to be best on the platforms, then you're going to organically get the best response. So content is really good, but having a strategy where you can actually understand when your audience is online and when the best time to post is going to give you your, your maximum reach or your maximum benefit of that content. Um, so a post schedule is really, really important. Um, how many of you guys are actively using social media at the moment? Cool. Um, from a business standpoint, if you're actively using social media, how many companies have a theme or have some kind of logic behind how and what they're posting? Does, does anybody? Um, as a business, as Blackdrop as a business, we use a content schedule to theme everything that we do. So on a Wednesday, we've got a, a content writer in our business. And every week, what we do is we try and get together on a Wednesday and we're kind of planning a couple of weeks ahead of ourselves in terms of what we're, we're working on. So uh, last week, I'm not sure if you saw our content, we did something on holiday marketing and why it's really important to actually have a holiday marketing strategy because believe it or not, when everybody knocks off work for the end of the year, they're on their phones. So what a great opportunity to capture people when they're actually relaxed and open to actually reading content and reading messages. A lot of people knock off for Christmas and and, and and disappear and go, I'm on holiday. And then it takes a long time to ramp the business back up again in the new year. But if you're actually active over that period, you don't have that drop off. So there's certain things like we talked a little bit about that in our content strategy, and that was our theme for the week. So on Wednesday, we do an article. And we post that article up on our, our website uh, first. And then we also share the article out on Facebook and LinkedIn. So that becomes our Wednesday format, holiday marketing strategy this week. On Thursday, we post on Instagram. Um, we have a bit of a quote that usually, more often than not, relates to something inspirational about the idea of what we're talking about for that week. On Friday, we generally do a video. Uh, so we actually have a couple of pieces of content that goes up. So where possible, we're releasing a podcast on a Friday. And that podcast is usually a conversation that we've had as a group discussing the subject matter or sometimes we bring guests in. So uh, Justin was uh, with us a couple of weeks ago talking about his experience growing Facebook groups, for instance. So as much as possible, you know, we're in that realm of educating our clients so that when we have a conversation, we can cut down that training. So the content that we produce every week is always themed. So, so this week, we had a panel discussion upstairs with four of our team members and we were throwing and looking at different campaign ideas that businesses were running. I looked at what Apple are doing and what a couple of other companies were doing for Christmas and pulled it apart and looked at the pros and cons of how they were executing, right? So that, that video goes up on, on YouTube on Friday. Uh, we also do an Instagram story, which reflects the fact that we've got something up on YouTube. Um, and uh, typically speaking, we also do another piece of content on Friday, which is a recap of everything that's happened in the marketing world that week. And so that also goes out on Facebook. So Monday rolls around. We do something called a one minute Monday. Tuesday is another quote. And then we're back into the next theme for the week. Okay. So we're always planning. Who are we going to get into? Who are we going to talk to? What content are we going to produce? What assets do we need to do? And we're working ahead of ourselves so that we've got a really logical post structure. It's consistent. And um, we know exactly what, what we're doing. The benefit of being consistent is your customers and your uh, clients will actually start to expect that from you. And the more you're out there, the more they'll rely on you, the more they'll see the content, the better a connection, the better relationship you actually end up developing with, with the people you most, most want to influence. So it's really important to start thinking about themes and start thinking about content there. Um, in terms of a content calendar, once we've got that idea on how things actually wrap together for um, the, the week and we're, we're kind of planning several weeks in advance, we typically put something like this together, okay? So um, 
Content calendars can be a simple Excel spreadsheet. We use something that's a little bit more visually driven. But as an example here, just so you can read, we're, we're, this is a two-platform strategy, just as an example. So we're out on Facebook and Instagram here. And then down the bottom here, we've got different types of content that could be posted. Okay, so when we're looking at this, we're going Monday, we do a Facebook and Instagram post. And what goes out there is an image. So we post an image on both of those platforms. Okay, on Tuesday, it's a story. So we're doing an Instagram story video. On, uh, on Wednesday, it's a, a Facebook uh, post. And uh, every second week, we've got a blog article that gets done. So, so ordinarily, if there's not something, it'll be a reshare or something that we've found that we're sharing, another image, so on and so forth, right? So having some kind of structure like this allows you to sit there and look at a month holistically and go, this is what we're doing this month. This is the content that we need to pre-prepare for. This is who we need to get in. This is what we want to say, what we need to prepare. And if you can be one or two weeks ahead of yourself, it will make the whole process easy and it will drive that consistency in the content that you're creating as well. Um, so these are really easy. You can download content calendars for free off, off Google. If you want this template, I'm happy to, to share this with you in PowerPoint. Um, just drop us a message on Facebook or something. We'll, we'll reply with a link. But yeah, really, really important. And this is the stuff that really helps you develop a starting point for your social media strategy. So once you've got that and you've got a clear direction of who you're targeting, what content you're going to go out with, the next thing is the engagement. Okay, so one of the things, or one of the places where people go wrong with their social media marketing is they'll put a post up and they'll leave it and it won't work for them. How many people have done that before? They've put a post up expecting the world to happen and, and yeah, yeah. Everybody that starts in social media goes, what am I doing? We'll, we'll write something and, and you, you, you generally learn this through trial and error, trying things and, and see what's happening. Um, so from an engagement point of view, there's a couple of steps here. So a content distribution plan is really, really important, okay? A con content distribution plan basically sits there and goes, Who's responsible for posting something? When is it going to be posted? What is being posted? And who's actually going to share it? So if you go back and you, you think about the metric of success being engagement, well, what is engagement? It's how many people like, share, and comment on a post. Okay. Now, pretty much every social platform, the more engagement you get in the first hour after that post is put up, the better value the platform will see that and the more spread organically you're going to get on that piece of content. So one of the best practices that you can do is actually have a group of people and they might be friends or they might be family, they might be employees, but basically have a schedule that says, cool, we've got this great bit of content, we're posting it up on YouTube, it would be great if you guys, once it's posted, within the first hour, can go and watch it, can go and like it, drop a comment on it, um, what happens is that triggers the platform, that triggers the algorithm on these platforms to pick it up and look at it and go, oh, people are discussing, people are commenting on this, it must be useful, it must be relevant. Okay, So what's really important, because these algorithms can be sneaky, don't use the same people all the time and leave some room. So you don't want to put the post up, you don't want to have a 15 minute video that you put up on YouTube and you've got seven people that have said great video before you know, two minutes after you've posted, right? So, so there are some logical things that when you think about, the algorithms will have some pickup. But if you kind of stagger people and you say, go and watch the video, kind of drop a, drop a comment on it once you've, once, you've, um, once you've done it. A really great way to do that is with groups. You know, if you're creating little community groups and stuff like that, just say, hey, we always post content on a Friday at 4 p.m., I'd love it if you guys could actually go and support us and, and watch it and, and engage with us on that piece of content, right? So there are ways you can do that authentically, um, but the more engagement you can get in that first hour, the better reach that that content is going to have. So content distribution plan is really, really important. Um, so there are some ways that you can distribute content. You can use social groups. Uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn, you've got great communities already in play. Okay, so if you're into sports, for instance, or you're targeting people that might be playing sports or might be in some kind of sports club, you can go on and find your soccer groups on Facebook and your you know, soccer associations and you know, your kids, kids holiday clubs and this, that and the other thing, right? You can join those, those groups and when you post a piece of content, you can actually reshare that piece of content into those groups. So there might be 10,000 people in a group and if you're a member and you're active in that group, and I think this is really, really important, Okay, if you join a group 
and you're only posting content in that group and you're not engaging in any other way, it's not gonna have as much value as if you're in that group and you're actually regularly engaging with the people that also post content. So your value to that group in terms of the platform is gonna be increased. So when you post something, it's more likely to get spread. Okay, so joining social groups on, on LinkedIn and Facebook is really, really good. Is that through the, the system itself? Fa like Facebook in particular. So um, I'm gonna talk about this, this in a moment, but Facebook at the start of this year, I'm not sure how many people um, saw all the stuff that happened in the court battles in the States with, with Mark Zuckerberg and, and some of the hearings. They obviously went into this tailspin and they re-engineered the platform um, and, and relaunched that at the start of this year. And the whole skew is Facebook pages don't get visibility now. Mm -hmm. Does anybody wanna take a guess at how much visibility if you've, if you've built a, a Facebook following, let's say you've got a thousand people on your Facebook page and you post on a Facebook page, how many people on average do you think will see that, that piece of content? It's about 1%. Okay, so, so you can imagine people that have spent years and years and years developing and creating these groups with, or these pages with 10,000, 20,000 likes, right? And now all of a sudden they're debunked because what's Facebook done? They've gone and said, oh, we don't want businesses spamming because our customers don't like spammy marketing, advertising posts, so we're going to strip it out of your newsfeed so you don't see it anymore, right? What they did do at the time that they released the algorithm, they, they put groups in place. And groups, if you post in a group and you're engaged with that group, then about 80% of the content that actually goes into that group gets distributed amongst the audience. So the visibility of content that goes into a group is so, so much more because you've opted into joining that group because you've told the platform that this is content that I wanna get. This is content that I wanna see. So Facebook groups, Facebook Messenger, there's a few things that we'll talk about. That's the direction of the platform. So as a business, what do you wanna do? You wanna actually start the groups, right? So where possible, join the groups. But actually, if you're creating content and you're creating content in a theme, create a group to run that content from. Uh, just very quickly, some other things, some other ways you can distribute content. Infographics are really good. Um, so sometimes, let's say you've created a video and you want to tell people that your video exists. Maybe there's something that you can put together quickly, a little graphic that can be shared on other places to point uh, people back to the main bit of content that you've got. Um, social bookmarking websites are fantastic, both for search optimization and also getting content out. So if you're doing an article, having discussion topics that you create, on places like Reddit, which is a great destination for social bookmarking. If it's visual, maybe drop an image up on Pinterest, right? So, so social bookmarking sites are basically sites that can be used to generate links back to your content. Using your other platforms to cross-promote content is, is a no-brainer. And then hashtags, which is something we'll talk about in more detail soon, is really, really important. Hashtags are probably one of the primary ways now that you can get people to see your content outside your immediate circles. Um, so this is just a quick overview of a, a, an Excel sheet, say, of what a distribution schedule would look like. So you generally have your post date, the content that's going up, who's responsible for driving or posting that content, where it's getting posted to is the primary destination, what time, what destinations that content's being shared out to, because you know if you've got a team of people that you wanna go and work on, you, you go, actually, can you go and like it also on these other, other places? And then the hashtags you actually wanna use when you're posting something. So if you've got a little Excel sheet like this set up, and you know, it could be a Google online spreadsheet that you can share with a few people, this creates some visibility on what's happening and what the stakeholders in, in your business should be doing uh, as well. Um, hashtags, cool. Um, hashtags, are, to put it in simple terms, it's like categories. So when you produce a piece of content, you wanna basically let the world know what categories that piece of content or that piece of content sits in. And what's really important is to actually research those hashtags before you use them, because you wanna make sure that when you use them, that the audience that uses and interacts with that hashtag is actually going to be valuable to you, right? It's, you don't just wanna get spread for the sake of it, you wanna reach the people that matter the most. So there's a couple of little tips and tricks on hashtags. Firstly, platforms have really dialed back on the use of hashtags because they clutter. So if you look at Instagram, Instagram have dialed, you used to be able to post and you can still post up to 30 hashtags on an Instagram post. 
You wouldn't want to though because it comes across as spammy and the platform's actually de-incentivizing that now. Everybody's pushing for more quality content. So Instagram now, does anybody know how many hashtags really you should be targeting? Any ideas? About five, about five. Um, so you want to be selective, right? And you want to be really purposeful at selecting those, those as well. Um, hashtags are all one word, so they don't, don't have spaces in them. And yeah, you absolutely want to research your hashtags before you actually start using them. How many of you guys have heard of hashtag density? Does any, has anybody come across the term hashtag density before? Okay. On Instagram, uh, hashtags are used by lots and lots of different people on their content. So if you're going to Disney, there'll be millions and millions and millions of people using hashtag Disney as a post, right? But hashtag let's go to Disney might only have 100, 200,000 followers because it's a little bit more bucketed or a little bit more streamlined, right? Now, what happens when you use a hashtag? Essentially, some platforms are really good. Some platforms just literally categorize it and there's there's no real order in terms of um, time on when you post it. But on Instagram in particular, and also Facebook, when you post a piece of content, we talked about engagement, the more engagement you can get quickly, the better. Hashtags are one of the ways that you can create that engagement. Okay, If you use hashtag Disney on one of your, your posts or one of your photos, it's going to be up there for such a small amount of time in terms of the window of visibility that you get that you're not going to have a lot of opportunity. Right, So a high density hashtag is generally something with 100 million or you know tens of millions of posts with it. And if you look at that, if you go on Instagram, go to the most recent feed, which is how Instagram typically work, when you post something, you put it up there and you refresh your feed, two seconds later it's already off the grid because 10 other people have posted in that, that time period with that same hashtag. Just for some perspective, anyone want to take a guess at how many hashtag Disney photos are on Instagram? Like a guess. Hundred and fifty thousand. I don't know. Just some nope. Yeah. Millions. Millions is hot. Yeah. <laughs> 53, 54, 54, My England today is a no winner. Fifty four point three million. million. Wow. Disneyland has twenty one million. So high density. What you want to do as much as possible is I tend generally when I'm posting on behalf of client activity, I try and stay away from the hashtags that have hundreds of millions of followers or tens of millions of followers. A high density hashtag is good because it gives you hits quickly, but I typically go after the ones that have sub 10 million. Okay? And then I'd use medium density hashtags, which will generally be within the one to two million bucket, and then low density hashtags with the hundreds of thousands. Okay? I'd pick a couple, and you can experiment on this, um, but the idea here is that the high ones get you immediate traction on your content, the medium ones get you some midterm, but it's still gonna be quick, and then the smaller ones get you traction over time. Okay, so if you're researching and you're looking at this, pick, this is why the research is important because you want to know that when you're posting something that those hashtags are going to pull you the right audience and give you the right timing of how long you have the opportunity to reach that audience for through that post. So there's a couple of things you might, might not have known about hashtags. Um, the other way to create distribution, this is really, really important is um, when you post something, typically speaking, you should section off about 10 to 15 minutes after you post to go and actually engage with other people on that platform, okay? So if you think about Instagram as a, as a prime example, so when you post something up on Instagram, if it's a photo and you don't have a following, the hashtags are your only way to get people to see your content and come back and view your platform or your profile. There might be other factors like location and other bits and pieces, but really the hashtags are the primary, primary one. What I like doing whenever we post on behalf of clients, and this is where having a social team or someone dedicated to this is important, I like going out and seeing who else is using those hashtags that I'm targeting, because believe it or not, Instagram will work out if you're engaging with content on the same hashtags that you post with. And if you're going and you're providing added value comments and liking other people's content, and you spend 10 to 15 minutes rigorously after you post, you're going to get more visibility, you're going to seem to be more engaging with those communities that you're trying to, trying to get to, and the platform will recognize that and will favor your content more when you're using those hashtags in the future. The, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in these algorithms, and this is why it, you can't just post. 
there's got to be a purposeful plan about how you go and distribute that content to, to maximize its effectiveness. Otherwise, you can put 500 bucks into creating a video and 10 people can see it and you go, well, that was a waste of time. But if you're purposeful and you have a good distribution strategy, tens of thousands of people that can see that video, the value changes. Um, obviously, clear call to actions are really important. So we talked about this, especially in ads. If you put something up, there's usually been a fair amount of work go into that, that piece of content. Make it really super clear what you want people to do when you actually see, see that piece of content. So a couple of pro tips here. Um, posting natively on a platform is really, really important. So natively, natively posting, what's really interesting is when you look at some of the platforms. So YouTube was really the destination for videos two years ago. Nobody else really were, were too worried about you posting a YouTube video up on Facebook or, or anywhere else. But these platforms, they want to be your source for content. Facebook wants to be your place to go and watch videos. Facebook want to be your place to go and figure out what's happening in the world and read news articles, right? They don't want you posting a YouTube video on their platform and then running off to YouTube and spending your time on essentially a competitor's site, okay? So they de-incentivize a post that comes from an external platform, whereas if you took that same video and put it up on Facebook and you uploaded it natively to Facebook, you're gonna get more reach from the platform because you're adding value to the platform rather than sending traffic away from the platform. So there's some things like that that when you think about native, native posting is really, really important rather than cross-sharing. Cool. The last one is, is measurement. Um, so just quickly here, what I'm going to do is as a business, you typically have business-orientated goals. Okay. So as a business, you want to grow your brand awareness. You want to, if you're in the um, uh, content space, you want to be a thought leadership expert, especially if you're dealing with places like LinkedIn. Um, word of mouth content is super important. Lead generation, obviously, if you're, you're out there selling services, and then sales if you're selling products. So these are your, your typical business goals, your five main business goals that you usually have. When you look at social and you start converting these goals into social media goals, um, these things change a little bit. So reach is the metric that you're concerned with on social media. Reach is basically your equivalent to brand awareness. Um, if you're wanting thought leadership, if that's your goal, you want obviously people to be commenting and engaging and interacting on your piece of content, right? Because it gives you credibility. Um, shares and, and mentions is like that word of mouth transfer. So if somebody goes on and they like, you know, what happened here? Somebody saw our our, um, our video, tagged someone else, and it's kind of they're, they're here too, right? So those shares, those mentions, that's your word of mouth in terms of social media. The form fills, uh, basically your lead generation. So when you typically put a post up online. If you're wanting leads, you generally take them back to a landing page where there's a form that can be filled out and those form fills basically become your conversion value or that metric there. And then sales, obviously you've got e-commerce. Um, so if somebody checks out a product and, and, and checks out with that, that's, that's a purchase. So that's, that's your, your social goals. And where they relate into metrics is basically reach is done and should be measured on the total impressions. So does everybody here know what impression means? Anybody, anybody want to want to comment on that one? Number of views, so it's the on the scroll. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so impressions are basically um, to to make it really simple in terms of Google. If somebody, if you're running an ad, and somebody searches on a keyword and your ad pops up, it generates an impression. It doesn't necessarily mean someone's clicked on that ad or read. Or, or read that ad, but but it's showed up in the feed, right? So there's going to be a percentage conversion here. So impressions is generally the metric that that gets measured. Um, mentions, how many times you're getting mentioned is that thought leadership, reshares, volumes, um, quantity of forms filled out, and then the conversions are really easy to track through product sales online as well. So here's just a little bit of a snapshot on how some of your social goals pull into play. Um, who doesn't use Google Analytics on their website? So everybody here is familiar with Google, Google Analytics? So just, just to put that in context, um, Google Analytics is free analytics software. It's really, really easy to connect that to the back end of your website. Now, the value behind this is when you put something up online, any piece of content, you want to measure how many people have clicked on that piece of content and gone back to your website. Okay. So if I um, just kind of use another quick example here. Um, 
your website is basically your primary destination where you want all your traffic to go to. This is typically the place, the end, and the end spot. So in a good social media strategy, like what we're doing in Blackdrop, we're putting content up on YouTube and Facebook and all these other sources, right? And typically speaking, if you look at Facebook as an, as an example, um, on Facebook, we're doing lots and lots of different pieces of content, right? So all of this content basically leads back here. Now, we can really easily, without doing anything, look at Facebook as a channel and go, oh, Facebook's driven two or 300 people back to our website that month. That's really good. But actually, on social media, you want to be able to go a step further. You want to know, okay, this is the article that I put up. This is the video that I put up. This is the, the image that I put up. And you want to actually be able to measure those independently from each other. If you don't have that data, it's very hard to work out what's working and yeah. where you should be focusing your attention on, right? Because you want to cut the stuff that's not working and focus your efforts on the stuff that is. So Google, Google Analytics. Uh, in terms of measurement, obviously there's a couple of things here to, to think about. You want to measure which posts are performing best. Uh, you want to understand what doesn't work and what's really good and, and something we do as a team on a monthly basis is we sit down and look at all the content we're pumping out and we go, okay, what's gone really well, but what hasn't gone well? Because I really want to dig deep and actually go, why hasn't these things gone well? And typically speaking, you can figure it out. You know, it might be the way it was worded. It might be the image wasn't as compelling as other images we'd used during the month. You know, there, there are things, but having that data and information gives you some output that you can use and, and, and do stuff with. Um, having a report as well, you know, and that, that doesn't need to be big. It can be an Excel spreadsheet that you just kind of list your metrics in. But having something that you can go back to at the end of the month and review is really important to, to creating a platform to, to move forward on.